All right. Always love to come up here like that. Always love to hear everybody shouting, screaming, getting excited. We do have something to get excited about. We do have something we could praise the Lord about. If you have the Bible, go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. All right. Uh, it's a blessing this morning to be here. It's a blessing uh, to be here with my brothers. I got my middle son here, Jacob. Uh, it's a blessing. Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes, it's not often that he's speechless, but uh, he's, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's good. It's good uh, to be here this morning. Um, as you may know, tomorrow we're going to celebrate uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's good. It's good to celebrate. It's good to think about the Lord. We should be thinking about His resurrection every day. Thinking about the death. The resurrection, uh, thinking about what he did for us. But we'll, we'll key in a little bit on that this morning. And a little phrase that uh, Jesus says here, and hopefully it'll help you here this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, it starts right here in the first verse. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary, Magdalene, and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And just a quick aside, you know, we see here that women go to seek the Lord first. And uh, maybe women have a little bit more of a spiritual inclination, a little bit more of an inclination to follow the Lord, maybe more than us men. But that should not be an excuse for us to let women just do everything, right? It shouldn't be that women are, you know, doing everything in the church. Or if you're married, maybe if you have kids or something, or if you do get married one day, it shouldn't be that your wife does everything in the house when it comes to spiritual things. You should be the spiritual leader in your home. And you shouldn't use the excuse, you know, well, women, you know, they're more in touch with the Lord. They're more spiritual. You know, we sh that make, should make us work even harder to get closer to the Lord. But that's just a little aside. You know, we can talk more about that. But uh, Verse 2, and behold... There was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Verse five. And the angel answered and said unto the women, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And it says there, he is not risen, uh, sorry, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said. I want to key in on that phrase. We'll pray here, and we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord, uh, just to be here. Thank you, Lord, for being here. Thank you, Lord, for these men that are here, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that they're here to seek you, Lord, to draw closer to you, Lord. I pray that you would bless them in that. Help them to draw closer to you today, Lord, and uh, just give them strength daily, Lord. I pray that you would guide them and lead in this message this morning. I pray that it would all be done for your honor and your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. As he said, everything in this world will happen as God says. That doesn't mean that we're robots and we just follow whatever God tells us to do. We just do exactly. Because there's a lot of evil in this world. And I don't think God is, you know, guiding us to do all the evil things that we do. That right. doesn't seem uh, to make much sense right there. But God, even though we're not robots, even though we're sinful, even though we break God's law, even though we disobey Him, He still somehow uses us. <coughs> He still somehow is able to accomplish his will through us and through the people of this world. And even through sinful men who aren't saved and who aren't seeking him, you can find that in the Bible. You can find somebody like Nebuchadnezzar who the Lord uses for his own will and purpose, people who are not even seeking him. So 
everything happens as God says. And you know, the Old Testament tells us how Jesus would come. He would come through a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And God tells us how he was going to come to this earth. It was going to come through a virgin. And you know what? That happened as he said. The Bible, t- and that, and just to let you know, that was 600 years before that happened. The Bible tells us where he would be born. In Micah 5, 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem of Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So the Bible tells us that he be born of a virgin. He even tells us his name, Emmanuel. Tells us the place of his birth, Bethlehem. And it tells us that this would be God. The end of that verse there in Micah 5, 2, it says, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. I don't know about you, but the only you know, person I know, the only I don't know, person I know that is from everlasting is God. God would take that upon that human flesh, would be born of a virgin, and come to this earth. You know what? It happened Amen. just as he said. Amen. The Bible tells us that he would live, live a sinless life. In Isaiah 42, verse 3 and 4, it says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, Amen. nor be discouraged. Till he have set for judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. The Bible tells us that Jesus would live that sinful life, and when Jesus was brought on trial, Pilate said, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Even those who knew, who hated him, knew that Jesus lived a sinless life. And that happened just as he said it would happen. The Bible tells us, if you want to turn to this one, the Psalm 22, Psalm 22, the Bible tells us that this this man that would come would die and even tells us the manner of his death. Tells us how he would die in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 14, it says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. But thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 16, for the dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among me and cast lots upon my vesture. It's almost like you're reading the New Testament right there. It's happening. The crucifixion, you see it right here. It says they pierced my hands and my feet. He says my bones are out of joint. My heart is melted like wax. All of these things happen as you are hanging there being crucified on a cross like that. Everything just... Your body is suffocating underneath its own weight. And you want to know the amazing thing about this prophecy? Not only the fact that it was written a thousand years before it happened, but crucifixion was not even invented until 520 B.C. That's like the earliest known use of a crucifixion. And on a large scale, it wasn't even used to about three to four hundred years before Jesus came. So the Bible's telling us 500 years before crucifixion was even invented, before it was even a thought in anybody's mind, how Jesus would die. And you know what? It happened as he said. Right? The Bible tells us a thousand years before it happened, and Jesus dies of crucifixion as he said. Turn to Isaiah 53. So not only was his birth 
predicted and happened as he said. He lived a sinless life as he said. He was crucified as he said. The Bible also tells us that he would bear our sin when he was on that cross. He would bear our sin in his death. Isaiah 53 is another passage that sounds a lot like the New Testament if you read it. I've heard of people reading this to Jewish people and the, and the person responds and they're like, why are you reading the New Testament to me? And they're like, no, I'm just reading Isaiah 53. I'm reading your scriptures to you, talking about this suffering servant. But Isaiah 53, verse 3 says, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we seemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our (coughs) transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days in the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus Christ, this is prophesied 600 years before the fact that Jesus Christ, when he was nailed to that cross, not only did he suffer a painful death, one of the most painful deaths that you can imagine, being scourged before that crucifixion, having his flesh ripped off of him, having his skin ripped off of him. If you remember in Psalm 22, it said, I see my bones, my bones, they look and they stare upon me. He was whipped so bad that he could see his bones through his skin. Or even not even through his skin because his skin was ripped off. But worse than that, worse than any of that, was taking yours and my sin upon him. The sinless God... Feeling that weight of sin. You know that weight of sin. You know what that feels like. You know when you've done wrong and you feel that shame. You feel that, you know, that that dirtiness on you. Imagine the sinless Savior who never felt that once in his entire life. From eternity past up until that moment. Never felt that shame of sin. That weight of sin that was placed upon him that was much heavier than his body that was weighing him down and suffocating him there on that cross he had that sin placed upon him and the bible told us it would happen and it happened just as he said second corinthians 5 21 says for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him you know what? It is a blessing. I, I, one reason I like being here is I can preach to men and I can preach about sin. And it's not like church people who are just trying to like hide it or be like, no, I'm a good person. you know. And, but you guys know what that's like. You know what that weight is. You know what that feeling is. And you can you know, feel, remember, and think about what Jesus Christ had to suffer for us. And not only did he suffer on that cross... Not only was his birth, his birth happened as he said, he lived a sinless life as he said. He was crucified. He had sin placed upon us. But what does verse uh, verse 9 say there in in chapter 53? It says he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Where Where did the wicked go in their death? They go to hell. 
And that's where Jesus Christ went to take our place. Psalm 16.10, another prophecy, says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Jesus took our place in hell. Not only did he take our sin on the cross when he was hanging there on the cross, but if you remember, Jesus said, Father, into my, thy hands I commend my spirit. They took his body from off the cross. They laid it in a tomb. But what about his soul? Right? We're, we're spirit, soul, and body. So is Jesus Christ. Psalm 16 says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. It's amazing how all these words just fit together. Everything just fits together. The spirit went up to heaven. His body went in a grave. And his soul went down to hell in our place. And it's predicted here. It's predicted hundreds of years before it happened. And it happened just as he said. And not only would he die, not only would he take our sin upon us, not only would he go to hell in our place, but verse 10 there in Isaiah 53 says, it, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall prolong his days. His days would not just end there in the grave. They would not just end there in hell. But his days were prolonged and he would rise again just as he said. So Jesus Christ's birth happened just as he said. He lived a sinless life just as he said. He was crucified. He had sin placed upon him. He went to hell. He rose again. And you know what? One day he's coming back. Amen. And it'll happen just as he said. He's going to come back in that glorious rapture day when it says the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord and if the Lord says that that's going to happen, I believe it's going to happen because all these other things happened just as he said. And there's going to be that time of tribulation that's going to come. And then the Lord is going to return again with his saints. We're going to return, come back with him to conquer this world and to rule and to reign with him. And if all of these things happened, just as his, he said, his birth his sinless life, his crucifixion, sin being placed upon him, hell, rising again. The rapture is going to happen just as he said. The second coming will, come, will happen just as he said. Go to Philippians chapter 4. You could be sure that this promise here in Philippians chapter 4 will happen just as he said. Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. You probably know this verse. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If you could be sure that everything has happened as God said, you can be sure that God will supply all your need just as he said. And like the brother said before, when he get, and I, that was amazing that he, he read from that passage and gave that little word here this morning because it fits exactly with this. Because it might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen today. To, you know, it might not happen in a few months, but it takes time. All right? God might not supply all of your need right away, but it will take time. I'll, I'll give you this testimony. I'll try to be brief with it. I mean, but uh, 15 years ago, I was married. This year, we celebrated our 15-year wedding anniversary. And when I got married, I was still in college. Didn't have much money. We had to live in my in-law's basement. Uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. But, you know, uh, we lived there. And, you know, we prayed for a home. We prayed for somewhere to live. And... You know, after a year, didn't happen. A little after a year, my wife is pregnant. 
We have our firstborn son, not this guy here. He's my second. Uh, but my firstborn son, he, he came uh, in December of uh, 2010. And then a few months later, we prayed, we asked the Lord for a home. And he gave, he, we went to see one, we put a down payment on it. It was a short sale. So it took a long time for us to get this home. It was from April 2011 when we put, this home, uh, put the money in for the home. And we didn't move in until February of 2012. Ten months it took to get into this house. And, you know, it was nice. It was a blessing. It was a small little two-bedroom house. It was right by the water. There was like 300 feet behind us was the water. Little board, boardwalk that we could walk down to the park. All this nice stuff. Little two-bedroom house, like I said. Nothing fancy. Perfect for what we could live in. Uh, remember Mark and Stephen here? They, they came over that house a few times. We were much younger back then. <laughs> they weren't married or anything at the time. Uh, they came and hang out a few times there. But we lived in this house for eight months. My wife became pregnant again with this, this guy over here. And... Uh, October 29th of 2012, eight months after we, we uh, moved into that house. We waited 10 months for the house. Eight months, October 29th, 2012, Hurricane Sandy happened. The water came rushing into the house. We weren't there, thank God. We stayed at my in-laws. We knew that something bad was going to happen. That water that we were like, yeah, this is awesome. We're living by the water. This is so nice to look at. Came rushing into the house probably five feet of water in the house and not just like water rain you know coming up and this was waves into the house destroyed the house we had it we tried to go back save some stuff out of it not much we tried we saved some clothes or whatever this house that we prayed for we thought the lord you know blessed us with this house took it away a few months later he was born we were back at my in-laws two children we waited a year. We're trying to figure out what's going on with this house. Are we going to you know, buy a new one? Are we going to rebuild? How are we going to get the money for this? I don't know what's going to happen with this house. Two years go by. Nothing happens. Wife gets pregnant again. <laughs> we have a third child. Still living in my in-law's basement. One bedroom, living room, this small little space. Thankfully, my wife, you know, she would go upstairs and be with, with her parents. But... Three years go by. Maybe the government's going to, we hear the government's going to buy out the house. After three and a half years, finally the Lord provides us the money. The, the government buys out our house. And then after four years after Hurricane S Sandy happened, we moved into the house that we're currently in now. And the reason I tell you that story is, you know, I prayed this. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Lord, I got three kids I'm living in a basement. I'm living in this small space. I got to see my in-laws every day. No, no, they're good. They're good. Thank, thank the Lord I got good in-laws. They're both safe. They're both good. But, you know, we want to have a place of our own. But it took time. It didn't happen overnight. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. And... If you can be sure that all these things in history have happened, as God said, our needs are nothing compared to those things, right? Some of those prophecies, I said 600 years, 1,000 years, even the prophecy, the first prophecy of Jesus being born of a, of a virgin back in Genesis 3.15, about 3,000 years before it happened. God is in no rush. God is in no rush. But when we rush things... We mess things up. Amen. If we let God work in his time and we let things happen and let God make things beautiful in his time, it'll happen just as he said. It'll be beautiful and it'll be amazing. Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for these brothers here. Lord, I pray you encourage them, help them throughout this day. Help them to seek you and be strong in you today, Lord. And help us all to honor and glorify you, Lord, the rest of this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.